Welcome! In this video I'll show you how to solve problem 2.27 as it appears in the third edition of Griffith's Introduction to Quantum Mechanics. Now this problem asks us to find the transmission coefficient for the potential that we worked with in problem 2.26, which is exactly the one that I wrote down here. Um, that potential is minus alpha, which is you know, just some constant, times the delta function of x minus a plus delta of x plus a. So in the previous video, um, we already found this form, right? We know that the wave function is a, which is the incident wave, times e i k x plus b, which is the reflected wave, e to the minus i k x. This is in the region x uh, smaller than minus a, right? Keeping in mind that in this case, we have one delta function at minus a and one at a. So we had three regions of interest. So one two, which is the region between these two, and three. So these are the three regions of interest. And in the second region between minus a and a, we have c times e to the i k x, this is the, the wave traveling to the right in that region, plus d, which is the wave that is reflected from the second potential, times e to the minus i k x, right, traveling to the left. And, <coughs> sorry, I'm a bit sick. And in the final region, we have f E I K X. So this is the wave traveling exclusively to the right. Of course, in this region, there is no wave traveling to the left unless we put one there like as in the experiment, but that doesn't really make any sense. Okay, so that is the situation. So what we wish to find is the transmission coefficient. So the transmission coefficient that we had defined previously as F over A. Basically, what is the magnitude of the incident wave that ends up being transmitted across this double barrier. And this thing is a squared. So we need to find F over A. That's what we need to do. Now, this is done as we saw previously. And in this sort of problems, the procedure is going to be the same or basically the same. So what we have to do is that we have to say, all right, let's take a look at two regions, right? Minus, or basically the intersections of minus A and A. And we want to apl apply conditions of continuity. So we want to say, okay, so the wave function has to be continuous at minus a and a. So, so that means, so let's say continuity, continuity at minus a. That means that the wave function that is to the left of minus a, so in region number one, so basically psi one, right, in region one, evaluated at minus a, this has to be the same than the wave function in region two evaluated at minus a. That is what we mean, we mean by continuity. And the same thing, of course, will be true for a, but we will do that in just a little bit. Okay, and just like we have the continuity of the, of the wave itself, we also have the, a requirement for the first derivative, just like you may have seen if you took some course in waves, for example. So we need the continuity of the first derivative, but since there is a delta in, in this problem, there will be a discontinuity because this is this like weird mathematical construction that we call a function, which is the delta function. So how do we find this? This is usually um, where people get it wrong. So this is like the main source of um, error that I have seen. So um, this continuity, at minus a. Of course, the same will have to repeat at a. So actually, in general, so discontinuity in general, then I'll show you for, for each particular case. So discontinuity, what we have is that we want to find basically what happens with the first derivatives. And the best way to do that, this is the trick, as we have seen in a previous video, if you're unsure, um, go back a few videos in the playlist where we explain it in more detail. Um, but we, we integrate the Schrodinger equation. So let me just write it down quickly. So um, plus the potential. This is equal to e psi x. So we want to integrate this thing just like right at be before and after one of our barriers. So if we are at minus a, we want to integrate from just before minus a. So we say like minus a minus epsilon and minus a plus epsilon. So we want to integrate just, just, just before one of our um, one of our functions. Let's say let's say we go for minus a. So yeah, I'm 
I'm going to have to choose here. So minus a minus epsilon and minus a plus epsilon. And epsilon, of course, being very, 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 very small. So what do we have here? Well, let's multiply by these constants here to get rid of them. And we leave the second derivative untouched. So we have integral from minus a minus epsilon minus a plus epsilon second derivative of the wave function with respect to x dx. And then we have minus 2m over h bar squared. But what is v? What is the potential? The potential is what we had before, what we saw up here, right? From the previous problem. So that is minus alpha times, uh, and this is integrated, by the way, uh, minus alpha product of delta of x minus a and delta of x plus a. Now, I don't remember which one I wrote first before, but it doesn't matter. Okay, and this is minus a minus epsilon minus a plus epsilon. And of course, we still have to multiply by the wave function and then dx. And then to the right side, we have the integral from minus a minus epsilon minus a plus epsilon of e psi of x dx. Okay, so now let's go for each one of these terms. Now the first integral, this is simply the integral of a derivative. So that means that by the fundamental theorem of calculus, this is simply going to be what is inside evaluated at the limits. So this is d, now not, no longer squared, this is simply the first derivative of psi of x dx evaluated between minus a minus epsilon and minus a plus epsilon. But let's now take a look at each one of those two, because minus a plus epsilon, that is just to the right of the delta function, and that is in region number two. So that means that when we evaluate our wave function at this point, and we take epsilon to go to zero, we will have the second wave function, so wave function in region two, but evaluated at minus a. And similarly, if we have, or if we take the point minus a minus epsilon, in that case, we will have wave function one, but when we take the epsilon to zero, it will be evaluated at minus a, but still uh, the wave function for the first region. So that means that this is simply going to be region two minus the derivative for region one. Oh, wait, that, that, there we go. And now we go for the next part. We have minus minus, which will be plus. We take the constants outside. And now notice that we have um, the delta functions inside. Now we are never, at least for now, we are not going to go anywhere near this region. So this doesn't do anything. And this means that the wave function is zero everywhere except for x equals minus a. Sorry, it's actually the, the other way around. My bad. So this one will not do anything. This one will. There we go. So this one will only not be zero at x equals minus a. So for that reason, the wave function will only exist at psi, so at minus a. So we will only have psi of minus a, right? The integral dies, we have the, the delta function kills the integral basically, because the integral is a, is a sum, right? Of all the possible values of x. But the delta function says, no, 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 there's only one possible value of x. Uh, that's why this happens. And then to the right, um, we have this value, but we're going to be taking a very, very, very infinitesimally small chunk. And that infinitesimally small chunk will have infinitesimally small energy, which is why this integral goes to zero. Right? I think we discussed it in more detail in a previous video. So if that's not uh, quite clear, I do suggest you go back a few videos uh, where we discuss this uh, in more detail. Okay, so now notice that this if alpha was zero, right, if there was no potential, that's what alpha zero means, if alpha was zero, then we would have that the derivative in each one of the regions would be the same. Right, if this was zero, if this wasn't there, then these two would be the same. And that is what we expect, right, there is the, it is a continuous derivative. But in this case, there's this discontinuity, which comes from the alpha term. And that is something we have to consider. Okay, so this is where the second term comes from. So you don't have to do this derivation, of course, 
Uh, once you know what it is, it's really fast to do in case you forgot the formula, but you have to just keep in mind that there's this extra term here, okay? As I mentioned, this is the difficult part. This is what usually screws people over in tests. That's what happened to me in one of my tests when I was taking this course. Um, so be very careful, okay? Now, let's go back. So I'm gonna actually get rid of all of these things so I can write this neatly together. Okay, so the derivative of the wave function in region two, that is this one. So we get I K, um, well, actually we, we hadn't re replaced it here, but we can do it now. So derivative of the second one is I K times C E to the minus I K A, right? I put in minus A for X. Then we have minus i k d, I'm taking the derivative, e to the plus i k a, right? I'm plugging this in here, just making sure that it's clear. And then what we have, we have minus, right? Why minus? Because now we are in this part. Now we go for the derivative of the first region, of the wave function of the first region, which is this one. So we get minus a, okay, no minus ik, of course, ik, we have to take the derivative, times a, e to the minus i k a, and then we get, um, let's see, now we have minus coming from this, so we get minus minus, so we get plus b, e to the i k a, and times i k, of course. And now we have this final part, which I will write to the right hand side. So we get minus 2m alpha over h bar squared times uh, this wave function here. Now, the wave function is the same. So you can take either. You can take this or this. Um, it doesn't really matter, but you have to consider what we want. We want to find t, the transmission coefficient. And that for that, we need a and f. So we only want to write things in terms of a and f. And in fact, in a large part of this problem, we will be trying to get rid of C and D. So for that reason, we want to write um, our Psi with A and B. So we do this as A e to the minus I K A plus B e to the I K A. Okay, now notice, of course, we can't just add these two together because here we have the I K in front. Okay, and we can actually factor out I K. So I'm gonna do that quickly. We can factor out ik. There we go. All right, so now that we have um, this part, let's write down our expression for the continuity expression at minus a. We already wrote it in general, but let's now write it out explicitly. So the wave function evaluated at minus a for the first region is this one. So we get a e to the minus i k a plus b e to the i k a. And the second region evaluated at minus a is c minus i k a plus d e to the i k a. So there we go, we have two equations, so let's label them accordingly, one and two. And now I'm gonna take this expression and put it to the side, and we will, we will have to use this again very soon um, wait, why did this not work? So can I move it now? There we go. Um, we'll have to use it again very soon because now we want to go for the continuity equation, but at x equals a, right? So maybe let's write it like that. So x equals a. Now that means that our wave function, so psi two evaluated, or maybe let's write of x, just to make sure that it's clear, at x equals a has to be the same that psi 3 of x evaluated at x equals a. So let's write it out explicitly. The second, the wave function for the second region is c e i k, and now evaluate at a, so we get this, plus d, e minus i k a. 
And then the third region is simply F E I K A. And this is equation three. Now, what we can do is do the same thing, but now for this continuity, right? This continuity at X equals A. Now, in this case, we have to take the same equation, but instead of two and one, we will have three and two. And if you want to rederive it, it is the same thing, but instead of using minus a plus epsilon for the limits, we use a minus epsilon and a plus epsilon. Okay, so using this, we have to take the derivative of the third region, which is the one with the f. So we get i k f e to the i k x, but we evaluate at a, so we get a. Now minus the derivative of the second region, which we saw before, but just in case, here it is again. So we get i k c e to the i k a minus, because there's a minus up here, i k d e to the minus i k a. And to the right side, we get minus 2m alpha h bar squared and psi of minus a. Again, which ones should we choose? We can choose either one of these. Uh, sorry, of a, not of minus a. Minus a was before. In this case, we are at plus a. So we can choose any of these two, but remember, our goal is to find f over a and take the modulus squared. So using c and d would make no sense. So we, taking f is better. So this would be f e to the i k a. Okay, and this is equation four. We can of course um, rearrange it just a little bit. We can multiply through by, with a minus sign and we can then factor out i k. <clears throat> now notice there are several um, things that appear everywhere. So this e to the minus i k a or e to the i k a appear on literally every single expression. So for that reason, we can think of how we can get rid of it. Now, one option is to multiply every equation by e to the minus i k a or by e to the i k a. Now I'm gonna go for this, e to the minus i k a, um, because it's gonna make calculations easier. In principle, you can do either, um, but we will see that this is going to be much better. It does require a little bit of like hindsight, but if you were doing this for the first time, just try either. And if you, it's a 50-50 if you get lucky and it's going to be very easy or if you don't get lucky and it's going to be a bit harder. Um, but anyways, you can fix it later. Okay, so we multiply by this. And what happens is that the negative exponent, exponents will now be twice what they were before. And the positive exponents are now gone. And that is going to be very, very, very useful. And since this, this expression will appear a lot, just for simplicity, we can define a constant, let's call it beta, which will be e to the minus 2i k a. This is simply for simplicity, because this will, we will have to do a lot of algebra and writing this the entire time will be annoying. And this will make it a bit <coughs> easier to work with the expression. Okay, so let's do the same everywhere. So when we multiply this, this thing will be beta, this thing will be gone, this will be gone, this is beta, this here is beta, and let's see, this thing is beta as well, and this is gone. Now you can see how the expression is getting incredibly simplified, right? Now here as well, this is gone, when we multiply, this is a beta. And this here is gone as well. And finally, this is gone, this is gone, and this is beta, and this one is gone. Okay. Um, now, notice there are still a few things we could do. Um, particularly, we have these iks. So let's divide by ik. So we divide by ik. So we write it here. 
Now we have an i in the denominator. We never like i's in the denominators. You could, of course, keep it. Um, you could, of course, keep it, um, but it's going to be much more annoying. So we can multiply and divide. So we have this minus, and we can multiply and divide by i. And since we had an i here, these two i's will cancel out, give us a minus sign, which will cancel out this minus sign. So in the end, we get positive and with an i here. And the same thing, of course, will be true for this part. If we divide by i k here and rewrite it, we have k underneath i here. Okay, so now we have, notice, here and here, the same expression. So we can define a new constant, let's say gamma, and this will be 2m alpha k h bar squared times i. So now, oh, I, I deleted, I, I erased the f previously. I'm sorry about that. I just noticed that. Um, okay, so this here is going to be gamma. And this here is going to be gamma. Okay, great. Now, is anything we can simplify? Yeah, there's still a few things we can simplify. So, for example, we can group up a's here in this equation, in equation number two. So I'm going to write it to the side a little bit so we can keep track of it. So if we take, I don't know, A's to the right-hand side and C and D's to the left. So we get C beta minus D is equal to, and now alpha factor of, well, both alphas have a beta, so we can write alpha beta factor of gamma plus one. Um, yes. And then we have B, and we can do B times gamma minus one. Okay, so now let me get rid of this and replace it with a simplified form. So that will be, and I'm gonna switch it because I like having A and Bs to the right hand side. But this, of course, doesn't change anything. Plus B. Be careful that you don't confuse your b's and betas. That's very dangerous. Okay. Now, I think we should be able to simplify expression four a little bit as well. So in expression four, we can put, once again, c's and d's to one side, f's to the other. So on the left-hand side, we have f one minus gamma, and to the right, we can write it as c minus d beta. So there we go. This is equation four now a little bit simplified. So the question is, I'm going to mark this so I don't lose it later. So the question is, how can we continue? We have now four equations and our goal is to find f over a. So we have still a, b, c, d, and f. We have five uh, five unknowns, which we need to get rid of. So notice that we have, for example, in equations one and two, we have c beta plus d, c beta minus d, right? And down here, we have c plus d beta and c minus d beta. So by adding or subtracting these equations, we will be eliminating d and b. It, uh, sorry, C and, and uh, D. So for example, let's add, I'm going to change colors, let's say equation one plus equation two, which I will now rename and I will call this equation five. So let's add these two together. So on the right hand side, we have A beta, we, and we are adding another A beta. So we get A beta factor of gamma plus, and now it is two instead of one, right? This one went in there. Then we have a b here, which will cancel out this minus one. So we get plus b gamma. And then on the right hand side, we have two times c beta and the d's cancel out. Okay, now we go for one minus two. You could of course go for two minus one, it's the same. Um, this would be equation six. So one minus two. This time, this will be the one that cancels out. So we get a beta times gamma and nothing else. And then we have 
minus, actually this has a minus sign in front, yes, because it is 1 minus 2. So, yes, it is minus a beta gamma, this part cancels out, then we get minus b gamma, and then we have plus 1, plus, yes, so we, and then we get plus 2b. So let's actually factor b in here. So this would be b times uh, 2 minus gamma. This is uh, plus b 2 minus gamma. And this will be equal to, now it is 1 minus 2. So the cb cancels out and we get 2d. There we go. Okay, now we go for equations 3 and 4. So let's add 3 plus 4, which I will now call 7. Okay, so we have f and f, so we get f times 2 minus gamma, and on the right side we get 2c and the d's cancel out. Now if we do equation 3 minus equation 4, we get equation 8, and in this case, let's see, so it is 3 minus 4, so when we do that we get f minus these things, the f cancels out and we are left with f times gamma. And this will be equal to c minus c, which is 0, and d plus the other d. So 2d beta. And now notice that we have an expression that is equal to 2d, 2d beta, 2c beta, 2c. So now we can eliminate c and d if we set equation 5 equal to equation 7 and equation 8 equal to equation 6, right? So basically, we can take this part and plug it in here, and we can take this and plug it in there. So let's begin by plugging equation 7 into equation 5, which will give us equation 9. So when we do that, we get a times beta, gamma plus 2 plus b gamma, this is equal to, and now we have beta times f 2 minus gamma. And now let's put, let's see, equation 6 into equation 8, which will give us equation 10. And here we have f gamma, is equal to beta times this thing right here. So minus a beta gamma plus b 2 minus gamma. Okay. Now we have these two equations and notice that we no longer have c or d, but we still have b and we don't care about b. b plays a role in the reflection coefficient we don't care about that. We care about the transmission coefficient. So we want to eliminate B from these ones. You can use your preferred method. I think that the easiest solution is to simply rearrange this equation so that we see that B is equal to, let's see, um, beta F2 minus gamma minus this part, A beta uh, gamma plus 2. And all of this divided by gamma. And from the other equation, from equation 10, we can find b. So let me maybe multiply through by beta to make this a bit easier. So this will be beta squared, and this will have a beta here. Um, okay, uh, actually, yeah, no, that's fine, that's fine. And we will have to put this to the right hand side. So we get that b is going to be equal to 1 over 2 minus gamma times beta times, and here we have f gamma minus a beta squared gamma. Uh, this will be plus though, because we have to add this, yes. Okay, and we can now multiply this beta through to make it just a little bit simpler. So we get a beta here, and instead of beta squared, we get a beta. Okay, and now see that we have b and b. So we set them equal to each other. So we get 1 over gamma times f beta 2 minus gamma 
minus a beta gamma plus 2. This is equal to 1 over 2 minus gamma f gamma over beta plus a beta gamma. Okay, and what is our goal? Don't forget, our goal is to find the transmission coefficient, which is f over a modulus squared. So we need to rearrange this to find f over a. So for that reason, we need to put f on one side, a on the other side. It doesn't matter which. So to do that, we will have to multiply by gamma and by uh, 2 minus gamma. So let's begin by doing that. So this will be multiplied by 2 minus gamma. And this will be multiplied by gamma. Okay. So when we do that, we can put everything with f to the left. So we get f beta 2 minus gamma squared. So we already used this. Then we get minus this part, which will be f gamma squared over beta. And then on the right hand side, we have a beta gamma squared, and then this plus a beta gamma plus 2 times 2 minus gamma. Or maybe we can rearrange this just to make it a bit more evident. Actually, it doesn't matter. I can just leave it like that. Um, I'll do it in the next step. Okay, so let's now factor everything out. So by taking the f's, we get f factor of, we have beta times 2 minus gamma squared minus gamma squared over beta. And on the right hand side, we have a times beta gamma squared plus beta. And now here, this is 2 plus gamma, right? So this is simply um, the sum times the difference. So this will be 4 minus gamma squared. And we can now see that this part will cancel out this. So the right hand side will simply be, there we go, 4 beta. And we want to find f over a. So for that reason, we have to leave f over a alone. So f over a, this is, and now we divide by this part. So we get 4 beta divided by beta over 2 minus gamma squared minus gamma squared over beta. And we can now simplify a little bit further, multiply by 1 over beta divided by 1 over beta so that this beta goes away, this one goes away, and here we are left with beta squared. Okay, so now we have f over a, but notice that this still has gamma and beta, and those are constants that we invented. Right? We made those one up. Now, what were they? Um, that's a good question. So gamma was 2m up, let me see if I can maybe move it, that would be very, very useful. Okay, yeah. Okay, so gamma is, okay, it's a bit of a bad placement, but there we go. So let's now rewrite it. So we get 4 divided by 2 minus gamma, which is, uh, that 2 is not supposed to be there. There we go. Um, which is going to be 2m alpha divided by kh bar squared i, and all of this squared. And then we have minus this thing again, 2m alpha kh bar squared. And then we have i squared, which will give us a minus sign, which will make this positive. And then we have beta squared, and beta was e to the minus 2i ka. So we divide this by e to the minus 4i ka. But we can simply rewrite this, since it's being divided, by e to the plus 4i ka. Okay, now notice that we can simplify this a little bit if we factor out this huge expression that used to be gamma. So let's do that, let's factor it out. So we get 4 divided by 
Now we take this out of the first um, expression. Uh, h squared, there we go. We can leave the i in there. And in order for us to do that, we will now have to multiply this by two, let's see, it's going to be k h bar squared divided by 2m alpha and minus i, okay? So I simply factored this out and it will be squared, of course, because when I take it out, um, it has this squared. And now if we factor this, because this also has the same quantity squared, we get e to the 4 i k a. So here I'm simply, I'm simplifying. That's what I'm doing. I want to simplify this expression. And notice that now, because why do I need to simplify it? Because we have f over a. We still need to take the absolute, the modulus of this and square it, right? And that's going to be very, very, very complicated unless we simplify the expression. So now we have this, which is much simpler. This here is simply a real constant. Okay, so now we need to see how we can work with the denominator a little bit more. Now, we are going to take this and take the modulus squared, but we know that by the properties of the modulus, we can separate them, right? The numerator and the den denominator. So for that reason, it's going to be worthwhile to rewrite this and just think of the denominator. Um, why am I doing this? Basically, what I'm doing is saying, okay, let this be, I don't know, uh, y or something, and I'm just going to say y is equal to something. Because I want to be able to work on this without having to write the entire expression all the time. That's what I'm doing. I'm going to simplify this, and then I will plug it back in. Okay, I hope this is not confusing. I'm just going to simplify this outside, and then plug it back. So working on the denominator, right? What is the denominator? Well, the denominator is... 2m alpha over k h bar squared and all of this squared. And then I still have um, 2k h bar squared, 2m alpha minus i squared plus e to the 4i k a. And there we go. So as you can see, this is pretty annoying we have a lot of constants going around. So what we could do is we could say, okay, we could say, let's call 4iKA because, or actually just 4ka, let's call 4ka, leave the i in there so that it is a complex exponential. Let's call this, I don't know, phi, because it is, it looks like an angle, right? When you have e to the i something, that can be thought of as an angle. And by doing that, we can rewrite this as e to the i phi, which already looks a bit better. And then we have this horrible expression here. So let's say, all right, let's call g, right, just some, some constant, is going to be um, k h bar squared over 2m alpha. Why not include this too? Because this same thing is outside, but without that too. So by using this notation, this thing right here is g to the minus 1, right? This is g to the minus 1. And since it is getting squared, this entire thing is g to the minus 2. Okay? And since it is g to the minus 2 in the denominator, right? It's basically g to the minus 2 here, right? That's what we are doing. We can write it in the numerator as g squared. There we go. And now it is already looking a lot better. Now let's go back here. And this thing here, as we mentioned, this is simply g. So this is g. Okay, now let's write this out explicitly. So I already took this uh, to the numerator, so it's not there anymore. Now let's square this. So we get 4g squared minus 2 times, 2 times g, so we get minus 4gi and then i squared, which is minus one. Okay, and what else do we get? Then we have this e to the i phi, but we can write it as cosine of 
phi plus i sine of phi. Okay, and you can see that using these change of variables has really, really helped us. That's why we did that. And now let's take the modulus of the denominator and square it, right? So we take this and we square it. To do that, it's going to be very convenient, sorry, to write this as the real part. So let's put everything that is real here. So phi minus one. Um, plus i times the complex part. And that's going to be a uh, sine of phi minus 4g. And now to take the modulus of this, it's going to be very simple. It's, we, we know what that is like. It's simply the real part squared plus the complex or imaginary part squared. So we have to square this part, which will be the, this part squared, so 16g to the fourth power, right? Just multiply this thing squared. Um, then we'll have this times this two times. So we get plus 8g squared cosine of phi. And then we get this times this twice. So we get minus 8g squared. Then we get cosine squared, cosine squared of phi. And then we have to multiply this by minus one twice. So we get minus two cosine of phi, and then we get plus one. Um, okay, one, two, three, four, five. Yes, we have six terms. That's what we needed. And then we have this thing squared, which will be plus sine squared of phi minus two times. So eight G sine of phi, and then plus 16 G squared. Okay, notice that we have cosine and sine, so that of that will be one. Uh, this is plus one, basically. And now let's put everything together. So we have 16 g to the fourth power. Um, then we have, let's take everything without cosine first. So we have minus eight g squared and 16 g squared. So we get plus eight g squared. Then we have plus, plus one plus one, so we get plus two. Then we run out of things without cosines. So let's go for cosine. So we get cosine of cosine phi times, there we have 8g squared minus 2. And finally, we have this last term, which is minus 8g sine of phi. Okay, so now let's plug this back into our expression. So we know that the transmission coefficient will be f over a. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Actually, maybe change colors as well. So transmission coefficient will be f over a squared. And we know that the numerator was 4g squared. So it will be now 4g to the fourth power. And in the, in the denominator, we have 16 g to the fourth power plus 8 g squared plus 2. This is all the terms without cosine or sine plus cosine of phi, 8 g squared minus 2 minus 8 g sine of theta. And now, of course, we can uh, factor out um, uh, 2 if we want. Let's see. Uh, so we can factor out uh, 2 from all of this. So we get uh, 8 here, 4 here, 1, and 4, minus 1, and minus 4. Oh, we didn't square the 4. That's my bad. 16. There we go. And 16 divided by 2 is 8. There we go. Okay, so this is our result. This is the transmission coefficient. Of course, we know what g and phi are. Uh, g is right here. It's kh bar squared over 2m alpha. And phi is 4ka. So this is the result we were looking for.
And if you would want, they don't really ask it in the problem, but if you want it to find the reflection coefficient, all you would have to do is take t minus one. Actually, sorry, the other way around, one minus t. Why? Because we know that r plus t has to be equal to one. And therefore, from here, uh, r is simply one minus t. Okay, no, just to make sure that you guys know that. Um, so yeah, as you can see, this problem wasn't really particularly complex. Uh, what we have to do is apply the continuity at each one of the boundaries. And the discontinuity, which is kind of the tricky part, where you have to use this equation. And after that, it was simply doing a lot, a lot, a lot of algebra. But that's it. So I hope this was useful to you. If it was, you know, please make sure to leave a like, comment on the video. It really helps me out a lot and it doesn't cost you anything. Subscribe if you enjoyed. And if you really like the content, uh, consider checking out my Patreon. Um, that way you can support me. It isn't necessary, but it really helps me out a lot to continue making more videos. So I'll see you in the next video. I hope this was useful. Bye-bye.